morning. How nice to see such a large audience. And be rest assured, you know, if you've got the wrong size, come to our booth and change it in the one that actually fits you better. And maybe even we have more. Um, very welcome. Um, my name is uh, Andre, Andre Molinar. I am, uh, yeah, we call it nowadays a solution engineer. Uh, basically, I am building data platforms ever since I started IT, which is 1995, I'm old, as you can imagine, and I transferred from wearing a suit into wearing hoodies. So everybody, you know, grows up I eventually. And I'm going to take you an introduction into what Snowflake is uh, for, you know, targeted towards application builders, plat data platform owners, etc. So first of all, what is Snowflake? Snowflake was familiar as a kind of a data warehouse in the cloud. I'll get back to more details why that's actually a good thing. But we see ourselves wider. We see ourselves in a broader context. First and foremost, I want you to remember from this session, Snowflake is easy. As I told you, I'm building data platforms for more than 30 years. And it has never been easier as it currently is. So that is really, really a good thing. But Snowflake, we see ourselves a little bit wider as just a service that prevents as, as, as a data platform in the cloud. Because it is not only the platform itself, it's the combination of the platform with the content that is on that platform. And historically, content was always privately owned because it was sitting in your own data center, it was sitting in your own controlled area. But now that we are running the cloud, it is not necessarily only for you, but you can share it within large organizations, but maybe also, out, also outside of your organization, be it with your stakeholders, with your customers maybe with the rest of the world, if you want to publish some open data. It is all in there, and everything that's sitting in the data platform is as easy accessible, as easy consumable as your private data. So that's that combination of the platform on top, and then the data that is in there. Data presented as a table for your query tool, but potentially a table with logic. We, then we call it an application. And that all can be part of that Snowflake data cloud world. Now let's dive into the platform itself. Why is it so easy to use? Why is it so simple to use? And that is, it is a platform, it's a service that is built for the cloud. So not only running on the cloud, it was built for the cloud. Most data services that we find in there were actually on-premise technologies that already existed and then deployed to the cloud. What Snowflake da, did when it was started nearly 11 years ago, it was, okay, the cloud is there. There's great benefit because if I need resources in terms of computer storage, it is there. I don't need to acquire them, so I can just take them. It's also the pricing of the cloud where, you know, you pay as you go. You don't need huge upfront investments. Now, those are typical the things that the designers of Snowflake wanted to introduce in the platform. It is something that was built for it, benefiting from that architecture that's available there. So it starts in the bottom. Of course, it's a data platform. We have data, right? Data is sitting in an object store typically. Why? Well, it is the object store is the most affordable storage you'll find in there on AWS, where I worked for a couple of years. We talked about the 11 nines, 99 point, and then 99% availability and assurance that it is there. If you store data there, really you are assured that the data is going to be there anytime you need it. It's also very affordable. There are different levels of storage. The object store by far being the cheapest, which is always a good thing, right? On top of that storage, we position the compute. Because you put your data there, you probably want to do something with your data. At least you want to see it, you want to group it, you want to count it, you want to, you want to work with it. Now, if you want to work with it, you need compute, you need CPUs. And that's what's sitting in that middle layer, that is the elastic part of the Snowflake surface. And the good thing about that elastic part is that if you don't need it, nothing is running. If you are a single user, you can start up a very small, tiny grid that works for you personally. If you are a large community, you can spin up a larger one, and it can grow. And it grows different than as you are expecting, maybe as a basic cloud service, because this one spins up instantly. Always in less than a second, you have it. And if you don't need it, you give it back, and Snowflake will charge you for the number of seconds that you're using the platform. So that is really easy consumable because you experience Snowflake at, as if it's always there. And that is the top layer of the platform. 
That's where we have what we call the cloud service layer. You can always connect to your data platform. You can always log in. It's always going to be there. That's not going to cost you a thing. It's going to cost you a thing as soon as you start doing something with the platform. So that's what this architecture makes really unique, makes easy to consume. It is a service, it's a managed service, which means you don't need to install, you don't need to update, you don't need to patch. That's all part of the service. So, how does it look then? We see this nice snowflake with the data sitting in the middle. That's the object store, and there's one here, but in reality, and that's because of the cloud works like that, the object store replicates itself across the different availability zones of the cloud region that you're running. At least three copies of your data are present. If one availability zone goes down, there are still two copies there. That's part of the guaranteed service that your data is going to be there. It's distributed over the region. Snowflake will distribute itself again over the different availability zones of the region. Nothing you need to do about it. We take care of that. Data in there is encrypted. We manage that. We make sure that the keys are stored in the service. We will rotate the keys. All things that you don't need to worry about yourself because we are benefiting from that cloud service. So when the data is there, we want to do something with it. So we need compute. All those computes are elastic. They are small clusters or larger clusters. And you can have as many clusters as you want around the data that you're working with. Those have a t-shirt size, hence that's why we are throwing out t-shirts, the smallest being in excess, and then from small to medium to large to extra large to XX large up to 6X large. And between each and every step, we double the amount of resources that you work with. And on those compute, you can deploy different tasks, right? So this is an example of a, typically you want to load some data into your data platform, can be a batch old-fashioned style of data loading using ELT tools, or getting data into it, streaming through Kafka, through messaging channels, IoT platforms, all, of course, being supported, going through a compute engine and stored in the object store. But you can have, of course, multiple use cases around it. For instance, data science and AI users that are using their tool set, getting to your data, Query users, BI tools, Power BI, you name it, you can position them all around that same data service. And when you start doing that, you start worrying about, okay, does the thing scale with me? Does it grow and, even more important, shrink with me according to my usage? And there are actually a couple of different dimensions to that scaling. The first one being isolating workloads. And that's basically the example that I give. What happens here is that on the left top, we see data flowing into my platform, either batch-wise or in the real time, getting into the platform. And on the right side, I have my data consumers, a machine learning user. I have a, a bunch of query reporting users. They all go through the same data. But what happens here, those three different use cases, they all have their private compute. So my ELT is running on this different set of computes, my query users are running on a different set of computes, and my machine learning user is having his private compute. And they are all independent. They will not notice of anyone's behavior if my data science user is spinning up a, different, uh, a model building task, consuming lots of resources, he will not interfere any of the other ones. That's what the platform is taking care of. And that's what the components of the stars, of, 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 the, <laughs> of the cloud is capable, is supporting us, right? Because the object store can have as many read connections to it as, as you can imagine. If new data follow, follows in after the commit, it's immediately available in the other areas. So it really separates the different workloads of your user community. Then there is also another dimension of scaling, which is what we call scaling up. And that is that, for instance, that machine learning user that is having his private clusters and start training difficult models. So what he wants actually is when he wants to start up his model, he needs more resource. What he can do in his session, and now take a close look at the data science, who is moving his S with a single statement instantly, in less than a second, up to four times more resources allocated to his environment. And then he starts his training job. And these things are then supported, where, for instance, if you want to load a billion records, it's going to take, what is it, nearly 14 minutes on the smallest. 
and half of the time of the biggest. And typically what you see if you start growing your compute cluster, that there is a linear scalability up to a certain point. In this case, sort of the scalability stops being useful when it gets to the L, which is an A times faster. But since we are charging by the second, the cost of that query is up to L completely the same. So he can either wait for 30 minutes for his job to complete and pay what is it, 88 cents, or he can grow his instance to eight times larger, being so much quicker, eight times more quickly, and still getting the same, uh, same charge. So that is what's possible, and the platform allows you to scale to elastically grow and shrink in less than a second as part of your workloads. The third dimension of scalability is what we call scaling out, which means you have a bunch of query users on the top right, and typically what you see, your Power BI users, they come and go. They start on Monday morning, you need a lot, but during lunch, everybody's going. So basically, in order to support lots of concurrent connections, you don't necessarily want a larger instance, but you want more instances. So that's what we can do. Elastically, let the system grow with the number of connections, and typically, depending on the complexity of your query, you can host up to 20 users on the smallest grid. And if 21 appears, start up a second one, stop a third one. And if there is a specific idle tie detecting, sh automatically shrink it down. Now, those are those components that really makes you use a cloud platform and consume it in the most cloud-native way where you're exactly paying for what you use. You can exactly adjust your infrastructure according to the workload that you're having, making sure that you only pay when you start actually doing something, and during the day, grow, during your process, grow, and automatically shrink or manually shrink according to your needs. So this platform was built to support basically all the data. Of course, we came as a, 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 from a world that was structured and relational as a database. But the world has changed, right? It is not only relational anymore. We're talking about structured, semi-structured, or unstructured. You can put it in all here, right? You put your JSONs, your XMLs, or even binary data. We can process that for you. What languages? can you then use on this platform? Well, of course, because of our heritage, it's SQL, and I like SQL, I dream SQL, but the world has changed again, right? So, um, within the database, you can use SQL, Java, SQL script, JavaScript as stored procedures, and of course, on the client side, we opened it up for many, many development platforms, Java, of course, being very strong in there, but uh, there is also, uh, 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 connections to, uh, to .NET and, and, and some other platforms that you, that you can work with, it's in there. Um, oh yeah, maybe I I easily important is that we have the capability of pushing down some, some Java or Python logic into the platform so that you can code according to the data frame APIs that you're nowadays working with, but making sure that the processing of that data frame operations is pushed down to the data platform, retrieving only results it to your uh, client environment. Now then, within this data platform, there are these nice features. There's time travel in there, so you can look in the database as if it, as if it was last week. But also what we have is, is a really cool feature called zero-copy cloning. You can create a copy of your database or your data platform without actually copying it. So when is that useful? You're developing your application. You want to test it. So you create a copy of your production environment that's going instantly, nearly, because we are only copying metadata. You can test it. You can write it. The clone will behave as a normal database, but only the modifications that you make will not make it into production. Production can continue processing. The clone is present at a completely different Compute grid, so again, totally independent, makes it really easy to replicate environments. Same for data science. Data science, if you travel to train models, you want to train your model on a data set that is fixed. Because if you test a new model, you want to make sure that you do, the, the better results you're gaining are not being influenced by changed data, but are actually influenced by better parameters or better training models that you're building. Again, cloning functionality comes in really, really handy there. 
It's supported by the Snowflake platform. It doesn't take time, and it doesn't cost any additional storage. Very, really cool feature. Now, the last one, that is an extension that we've built on our platform. It's called Snowpark, and that allows me to code using the data frame API that we'll find nowadays in, 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 in Python, but also in some other languages, or PySpark for that matter. You code your data frame API as if you're running inside the environment, inside your own client, but the data operations will be pushed down into the Snowflake platform, and when it's in the Snowflake platform, it can benefit from that grid architecture that allows you to grow and shrink dependent on the amount of data that you're processing. So this is how that's working. We have that client where you have your, your Python or your Java environment. You code your data frame, and it pushes down. Now, it's, of course, a, a conference that comes from the Java community, but we see nowadays Python picking up really, really, really fast, so there's a lot of things going on there. So we've enriched that snow park also in to, towards the Python environment. The Python community is vibrant. There's a lot of development and new features coming in. But we opened up our platform in a way that we think you should be able to consume it as organization when you start worrying about governance and security. So we introduced Python in our platform, but in order to make it robust and secure, we created a specific Anaconda channel, and that Anaconda is managing the library that we allow in our platform. Making sure that, first and foremost, the libraries can work together, that you don't run into library conflicts, as you most cases, or I personally many times run into. Secondly, these are all tested libraries, and they got through some security controls. So that's what this all brings together, the joy of Python, the capabilities of Python, the data frame API coding of Python, but then pushed down to the platform in a controlled fashion to let this platform run as fast as possible for you, and to get the easiest way and get access to all those functionalities uh, in your platform. So, basically, that's what I wanted to share with you, the introduction into, Snow, into Snowflake. We are present here at the boot. There are more t-shirts there. There is a nice test. What I can also recommend is uh, attend our uh, session. I think it's at 12 o'clock, where you will be able to see the product, but we have it available in our booth as well. And finally, we got more t-shirts, and there is a nice quiz for you to get these nice snowwares. If you want to get started with the product, scan this QR code. Snowflake is so easy. You can start it for free. You'll be up and going in 10 minutes, I think, and you can try these things all out. Thank you so much for your attention, and enjoy your show.